of society. This kind of piety had a really subversive element to it because God, for some reasons best known to himself, had not picked all the upper classes to have this intimate communion with him. In fact, God seemed to be passing out his favours to weavers and shepherds and servants and just all over the place. For the truly committed, the covenant touched every aspect of life. Warriston, torchbearer of the Covenanters, drew up a new family version of the covenant each of the 13 times his wife gave birth to a child. The whole family signed this new oath to God. The intensity of the experience could be uplifting and energizing, but it could also place immense and unhealthy psychological pressure upon the faithful. It's very hard for us to imagine now a society in which people had such a strong belief in heaven and hell, and it shaped so much of their lives. If you genuinely believe that somebody who hadn't had a conversion experience would go to hell, what did you think about your children? Well, people generally believed that the little ones would go straight to heaven. But then as your children grew up, they reached puberty, they became teenagers, they went into this dangerous age where you worried about them. <coughs> you get young people sitting awake at night, screaming and groaning and crying and praying because they really, really fear they are going to hell. It's a life of enormous intensity. You live your life at a great emotional pitch. Now, some people could absolutely crack. And Warrison's own family suffered terrible traumas. When his son slipped into insanity, Warrison suspected it was God's judgment on his own sins of pride and ambition. There had to be a reason behind everything. Warriston obsessively sought the divine logic in every event from the trivial to the tragic. If the family cat threw up, it was interpreted as God's will or just as likely the devil's. Nothing else but the free love of the Father is the beginning of our salvation. And Christ is he in whom our righteousness and salvation dwells. This then was the world of Presbyterian Scotland of people driven into the intensity of the covenanting experience by Charles' bungling insensitivity. Far from achieving religious uniformity, his clumsy arrogance had provoked a backlash of devastating ferocity. But instead of acknowledging his mistake and trying to patch things up, he only made things worse. I would rather die than yield to their impertinent and damnable demands. He tried to buy time by calling a general assembly. For the Covenanters, it was a momentous opportunity to right wrongs. They denounced royal supremacy and abolished bishops in Scotland. In response, Charles declared war on the Covenanters. But Charles could not finance an effective force. Nevertheless, he marched an ill-prepared army north, hoping to scare the Scots into submission. Warriston was in favour of fighting. They have neither Christian nor Scottish hearts who will expose their religion, their country, their neighbours or themselves to present danger without taking part. Every available man was called up to defend the Covenant, the ranks swollen by experienced Scottish fighters returning from service overseas quickly bringing anti-covenant Scottish cities to heel, a formidable covenanting army lost no time in preparing for battle with Charles. Bailey was among them. As military chaplain for a covenanter regiment, his conscience was torn. As a conservative, taking up arms against Charles' forces left a bad taste in his mouth. But Bailey's first duty was to uphold the covenant if the only way for the king to learn the error of his ways was through bloodshed, then so be it. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. The opposing armies massed muskets and swords at the ready. 
But then events took a twist on the very brink of battle. It didn't happen. Facing the disciplined and skilled army of the Covenant and knowing his own forces were weak, Charles got cold feet. He stopped his troops at the border. Stalemate rather than bloodshed was the order of the day. But if Charles thought he'd got away scot-free with his warmongering folly, he was in for a shock. The Covenanters invaded England. The disorganized rabble of Charles' army scattered before them. God was surely with the Covenanters. The Scots really take the initiative here. They move into England, they take over Newcastle and Durham, and Charles, I think, is a bit surprised. After all, this is not supposed to happen. The Scots are seen as their usual barbarian bunch of ruffians. Who, what do they know? But, of course, a, a good number of Scottish officers had come back from the Thirty Years' War to take part. They'd served as mercenaries there, and they, they came back when they heard the clarion call of the Covenant. Over they come, and they, they engineer some pretty decent victories. Now, this was particularly bad news for Charles I, because suddenly your armies were getting beaten and you were running out of money. When you run out of money as King of England, you have to call a parliament. And when you call a parliament, all these people who've pent up all these grudges against you feel it's time for them to let out their grievances before they give you any money. So you're basically, you're on the back foot in Scotland. You've got political tension in England. In Ireland, you've got a really unhappy Catholic Irish population. And of course, what they do, this is what really damns Charles. The Irish say they are rebelling in the name of the king. And when the English parliament hear that, they go bananas. They think the king and the Irish are coming to get them. And unless they make common cause for the Protestant Scots, everything's going to be overwhelmed, the Reformation's going to be overturned, and it will be all back to Catholicism and bring on the Inquisition. So that's how we get to the Civil War. So in just a few years, the Covenanters had gone from being an irritating thorn in Charles' side to becoming the catalyst for his catastrophic downfall and a turning point in history, and they knew it. With the chaos of war came an unmissable opportunity for the Covenanters to fulfill their ambitions. They seized the moment. As the Civil War raged, a handful of Covenanter leaders left for London to negotiate with the English parliamentarians. With them, they took a radical deal that, they hoped, would secure the futures of both their kirk and their state. I always call it a guns and gold alliance, because basically it's saying that the Scots are going to support the English war effort, we're going to fight together, but in return, the idea is to bring religion into line across the United Kingdom. So they think this means the English are going to take on Presbyterianism. You'll never get some English government trying to enforce bishops on Scotland again. They're going to make the revolution safe by exporting it. Exporting the revolution south would not only consolidate Presbyterianism in Scotland, it would be the salvation of England as well. Here was a golden opportunity to do God's work, and the Covenanters grabbed it with both hands. The deal that was put together was called the Solemn League and Covenant. The Solemn League and Covenant effectively was a deal where the Scots offered, in return for England accepting Presbyterianism and their entire covenanting agenda, the Scots offered their army to the English Parliament. Now this effectively was very bad news for Charles. He was doomed from this point here on because he had two large armies opposing him as opposed to just the one. For the Covenanters, the deal promised the ultimate prize in return for the Covenanter muscle that would ensure victory for the parliamentarians, the deal stipulated a reformation of religion in England according to the word of God and the examples of the best reformed churches, which meant, of course, installing Scottish Presbyterianism across England. 
Protestantism in England was still taking shape. The Solemn League and Covenant would make sure that the English church would turn away from episcopacy and embrace Presbyterianism. How it would be put in place would be worked out later. In the meantime, there was a war to win. I think there's tremendous arrogance there on the Scots part. It's like we couldn't believe anyone was going to disagree with us. You know, we're going to send down our big guns, our best preachers, our really hot divines, and, you know, once people hear it, they're just going to all say, well, why didn't we think of this before? You know, why didn't we all think we wanted to be Presbyterians? <laughs> so I think it is a bit naive. This was a deeply ironic but very dangerous moment for the Covenanters. Just a few years before the outbreak of the Civil War, Charles I had hopelessly misjudged Presbyterian Scotland by trying to impose Anglican church practices on it. His clumsiness caused a revolution. Then along came the Covenanters to play the flip side of the record. Jesus and no quarter! Jesus, Jesus and no quarter! Jesus! With a Presbyterian Britain as their ultimate prize, for the Covenanters, the Civil War was a holy war. But soon, the Covenanters found themselves fighting on two fronts, against Charles to the south and against Scottish royalists from the Highlands. Tens of thousands were dying on all sides, in battle or from disease and hunger. I think apocalyptic would be a very good word to describe this savage scene. We have all sorts of stories of atrocities on one side, atrocities on the other. That's the nature of warfare, of course. These were all united, actually, in their hatred for one another and in their religious bigotry. You would have found it almost anywhere in Europe at this time, but I don't think that's much comfort if you're the guy that's facing down a gun which is just about to execute you. From this bloody turmoil, one Englishman was emerging to dominate the parliamentarians in London, Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell was a formidable military commander and with the help of the Covenanters, the war was swinging in his favour. Soon, he would be dictating the future of Britain. Cromwell was a Puritan who shared many beliefs with the Covenanters, but an uncomfortable realisation was dawning. He had no intention of enforcing Presbyterianism across England. The kind of theocracy the Scots wanted would have been intolerant of many groups who supported Cromwell politically. It was beginning to look as if the parliamentarians were going to renege on their part of the deal. But then the war took an unexpected turn. With Cromwell's troops hot on his heels, Charles found himself seeking refuge with the Covenanter army. At first glance, this might seem a bit bizarre, but he calculated that while the Covenanters had rebelled against him, the Covenant, at least in principle, had pledged allegiance to the monarch, whereas the parliamentarians really had it in for him. On this occasion, at least, the Scots were the lesser of two evils. But the Covenanters were frankly embarrassed to have Charles turn up on their doorstep Anxious not to antagonize the English parliamentarians and lured by the promise of 400,000 pounds in unpaid fees for their part in the war, the Covenanters handed Charles over to the parliamentarians. Traitor Scott sold his king for a groat was the English jeer. But through their course of action, the Covenanters had brought the conflict to an end. For a while, the future looked bright for the covenanting regime. Many Presbyterians were uncomfortable that the king was in Cromwell's custody. But with the king safely tucked away, the covenanters grabbed the opportunity to create the kind of Presbyterian state the Reformation had promised them. It became known as the rule of the saints. They were really trying to set up the Republic of Jesus Christ. This was the rule of the saints. Now, these guys actually believed they were living in the last days, that the second coming of Jesus Christ was upon them, that the time had come to clean up the house. For